morning. It's just great to have you with us today. We're North Berwick Christian Fellowship. We're a church that meets here in North Berwick. You can find out more about us on our website. If you're living locally or whether you're further away, we're just grateful to have you with us today. My name is Neil. I'm going to be leading us through our service today. If you have any questions or just want to get in touch, then please do email me. I'd love to hear from you. If you're newer to us, then just to let you know, there's a few different ways you can connect in. So uh, as a family, we do lots of different things in this season. One of them is that we meet on uh, online uh, at the moment. So you can join us at 11 a.m. every week on YouTube where our service will be broadcast. You can come in and engage there. Uh, we also, if you want, you can join us at earlier at 10.30 a.m. on Zoom. as a chance to get to know some of the people in our fellowship uh, to pray together, to encourage one another. So uh, get in touch if you want to join us on Zoom. Uh, we're also meeting monthly in person. And so uh, our next one is actually next week on the 26th of September. We're meeting next week, 1.30 at St. Andrew Blackadder Church here in North Berwick. So you, you enter via the St. Andrew Street entrance, not through the, the high street, um, and you can book your place online just to help us comply with track and trace. You can also sign up for our weekly email at NBCF Connect and you can sign up at our website if that's something you'd like to do. On to today. Well, today we're going to have um, a short time of worship and then a message today from uh, Jo and she's continuing in our series Family Foundations. Last week we looked at building healthy connections. This week we're going to dive deeper into the whole topic of communication. How do we communicate well with one another? So stick around for that. But first, we're going to have a time of worship. We come to worship you this morning, Lord. We once again still our hearts in your presence. We lift our eyes to you, God. We give you thanks for your faithfulness to us and your great love for us. Using the words of Psalm 66, shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name, make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you they sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Let's worship together today.
Good morning. This morning I'm going to continue on in our Family Foundation series, which Neil started last week talking about relationships. And I'm going to be talking about communication this morning. Now, I do not think that for one second I can cover everything that there is to cover on the topic of communication. Communication is a topic that we could literally spend a whole year on and still have more to talk about. There are so many things to learn about communication and the dynamics that it entails. So today we will be focusing on communicating love and how as a church family we need good communication as a family foundation. So Mark 12, 30 to 31, if you have your Bibles with you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. So here we're talking about the first and the second of the greatest commandments. The greatest commandment is to love God with everything in us. And the second is to love people. Now often we stop there, but the verse does go on to say that the only way that we can know how to love other people is by loving ourselves. Love your neighbour as yourself, or as I often think of it, as you love yourself. We love others because we are able to love ourselves. And this requires us to know ourselves, to know our needs, to know what makes us tick. I'm able to love out of the overflow of who I am because I can love myself well. To clearly communicate love, we first need to know what is going on inside of us, what our needs are and how we experience love. Once we have that, we're able to communicate really well to other people. So communication is so much more than the words that we speak and the language that we use. Communication involves all of who we are. And we kind of see this in the first commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And the same principle in communication is here, that communication involves so much more of who we are, involves our heart, which is like our motives, involves our words, which is the language and the tone in which we use, our body language, are we engaged or are we closed? and our listening. Listening is an important part of communication. Our ability to really hear what somebody is saying and that's called active listening. So love your neighbour as you love yourself. Good communication is a way of showing value. Because I value you, I will make the effort to communicate what is going on inside of me and I will communicate in a way in which shows you that I love you and that I value you. I need to understand myself first and what is going on inside of me before I can communicate. If I don't understand it or myself, then how can I communicate if I don't know what's going on inside of me? So Neil mentioned this last week, he talked about powerful people. A powerful person is somebody who knows themselves and who knows their value. This is not somebody who is a a Popeye type person or somebody who's strong arming somebody else. Actually, I would say that that is a powerless person. A powerful person loves well and is able to communicate that love. They have worked hard on understanding themselves and communicating their needs well to people around them. They know that they are responsible for themselves and that they have the spirit of self-control, not others' control. A powerful person will manage themselves. They will not try and manage or control other people. That is what a powerless person would do, is try to exert control but a powerful person is responsible for themselves and powerful communicators use clear communication. They send the message to people around them that you matter and so do I, that we are equal. They're saying that my thoughts and my needs matter and so do yours. What they're saying is that both people, both partners or both parties, however many people are involved, in the relationship are equal. There are no power plays, there's no pulling down of the other person. They show the other person what they are feeling inside of themselves and they communicate that clearly. And as they communicate that clearly, it helps to communicate value and understanding. What they're saying is that I value myself and I am communicating that to you. And it is because I value you that I'm listening to what is important to you and we are communicating. 
This is at the very core of honour and mutual respect, value and understanding for yourself and for other people. I value and I understand myself and I value and now understand you because you have communicated that to me. So to communicate well, it takes both parties to communicate. The first goal of communication is understanding. Often we think that agreement is the goal of communication, but it's not. The goal of communication should be understanding. If I understand you, I can move towards you in ways that builds up our connection. It helps the relationship to go deeper with honesty and with trust, it, but it is a two-way street. It is not one person communicating. It takes both parties to communicate well in a way which strengthens connection and understanding. In order to love someone, we first have to know and love ourselves. Like the verse was saying, love your neighbor as yourself, to know our needs and to get them met. Now, I remember when we first began to look into all of, all of this kind of communication and leadership sort of profiling, we first realized that we had needs and we were in our mid twenties and we hadn't yet realized that we had needs within who we are as people that went beyond our basic needs of oxygen, food and water. And we've been on this big journey ever since then of learning what it is to meet our needs, to recognise that we have needs as individuals, that we have needs and that if we don't get those needs met, we begin to suffer as a result of that. So for example, I have learned that outside of oxygen, water and food, and those basic human needs that we have, that I have needs for me to feel like I can be the best version of myself. I have needs which I have to have met in order for me to be the best version of myself. So here's a few of them. I need to have alone time. For me to feel like I can be the best version of myself, I cannot spend all of my time with people 24 seven. I need some alone time. I also need to exercise. I need to be able to have fun. My personality needs to be able to have fun. And if I go for long periods of time without fun, I, I, I struggle as a result of that. I also need rest time. I need to have quality time with just Neil, just him and I. And I also need to have quality time with just Neil and the girls as a family as well. And I also need to have encouragement. Now there's many more needs that I'm sure I have, but this is just a starter for 10, that I have been on a journey and so is Neil, of learning what are our needs. And we have the opportunity through my own understanding of my needs to be able to communicate well to Neil and the girls around me that this is what I need. And for me to be the best version of myself, I need to meet these needs, but also they have an opportunity to help meet those needs for me. So knowing our needs comes through understanding ourselves. And then we get to get those needs met by other people by communicating them to other people. So babies cry to get their needs met. That is the only way that they know to communicate is to cry when they poo, when they are hungry, when they are tired, when they are sore, when they are not well. The only way they know to communicate is to cry. And as our girls grew up, we tried to begin to teach them different forms of communication to help them uh, communicate. So initially we taught a little bit of baby signing, just the very, very basic stuff. So we taught them food, we taught them drink, and we taught them more, so if they wanted more. And that was helping them to progress from just crying. So there were some basic needs that they had that if they were hungry, they could tell us that they were hungry or if they were wanting more of that delicious dinner that we'd put in front of them, that they could tell us that. And then the theory was that as they were able to speak, that they'd be able to communicate their needs for us. Now that is a working uh, theory, that's a working progress at the moment because as kids grow up, they still have to learn what the needs are inside them and attach that the feeling that they have, because often kids just have a feeling and they don't know how to communicate it yet because they don't quite know what that need is, even though they have language. So we try to help them to understand those feelings. So we have something in our house which uh, we experience, which is called being hangry. Now, I don't know if you've ever come across being hangry before, but this is the experience of being hungry and angry at the same time. It is an extreme form of uh, hunger which affects all of the emotions and they become hangry. And as they experience this, we try to teach them the underlying need behind that feeling. Honey, 
Do you think you might need a snack? No, I don't need a snack. I think you might open your mouth and let me give you a snack. And once they have it, do you feel better now? Yes, I feel better. Do you think you might have been hungry? Yes, I do. Okay, so we're trying to learn to recognise that that feeling was attached to a need. And as they grow, we're trying to help them to spot their own needs as they begin to experience things within themselves. So we might ask them things like, what are you feeling? What do you feel like you might need right now? So one of our girls particularly, when she tired, it gets tired, she can get quite grumpy as we all can, but she can get quite grumpy. And we have learned that actually one of the things that she needs when she's feeling tired and it comes across, the experience is grumpiness, the cause is that she's tired, but actually the need that she has is alone time. And as parents, we have learned to spot the cues and the signposting towards this. And we're trying to help her to learn that as well that she needs alone time. So we try to help her see that. So I might say to her, honey, what are you feeling just now? She'll say, oh, grumpy. And I'll say, oh, okay, so darling, what do you think you need? Oh, I don't know. And I'll say, well, I think you might feel a little bit better if you had some alone time. What do you think about that? And she might go, oh, I don't know. And I said, well, how about you go up to your room and you do some playing and you come down when you feel like you are ready anytime, okay? And she goes, fine, and off she goes. And she comes back so much happier, so much better because she's had that alone time. Now, as this little girl, as our girl has grown, she has got so much better at recognizing this for herself. And often she will come to me and she says, mommy, I feel like I just need some alone time. And I say, great job, hon. Well done for recognizing that. You come back whenever you feel like you're ready and you let me know if there's anything that you need from me. She is learning that she has needs and she is learning how to communicate them. But also in this transaction of her communicating that, she is giving me the opportunity to help meet her needs. I can provide a space for her to have alone time. I can make sure that the rest of the family don't interrupt her. But also I can maybe provide a snack or whatever she might have in that need. And what this does is this increases our intimacy, our trust, and it strengthens our connection. She has understood that she has a need. She's understood what that need is and she has verbalized that. She has become vulnerable to me and said, I have a need, will you help me have that met? And I have the opportunity to do that. That is a perfect example of what we are talking about today, of understanding our needs and communicating that so we can strengthen that connection and uh, have our needs met. And we see this modelled with God. He knows our needs. He knows everything about us. He knows every thought in my head, even before I have them. And he asks us to tell him what we need, to communicate our needs to him, before, uh, even though he knows what they already are. And we see this in the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, 8 to 13. And it starts by saying, before it goes into the Lord's Prayer, it starts by saying, your father knows what you need before you ask him. And then it goes on to say, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we, as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. He knows what we need before we even ask for it, but he wants us to ask it anyway because revealing your need strengthens connection and allows other people into our world. And our Father in heaven wants to meet our needs inside of a connection where we are being vulnerable, where we are coming with our needs and saying, Father, this is what I need. Now, he knows what that need is. But that coming in a place of vulnerability strengthens connection. Like when one of our girls comes to me with that need saying, I need this. She's coming to me vulnerable, saying, this is what I need. And will I meet her in that place to strengthen our connection. It is in that connection that we get our needs met with one another and with God. This is the exact same in the relationships that we have around us. By knowing our needs, we can share them, giving people around us the opportunity to strengthen relation, to relationship and connection. We are not meant to be independent people. We are supposed to rely on one another and be a community, be a family. So there are lots of ways of understanding yourself and other people around you. And Neil and I really like using personality profiling. 
they can tell you a lot about yourselves and the other people that are around you. And yes, they are a limited tool, but they can be quite helpful and they can be really useful in understanding people. But this sort of stuff takes intentionality. It takes intentionality to understand yourself, to take time to understand yourself and to take time understanding the people around you so that you can build connection and uh, intimacy together. And one of the tools that I want to talk about today is the five love languages. Now you may have heard about the five love languages, you may not have, but I want to talk about it today. I like the simplicity of this tool and it's really easy to use when understanding yourself and other people. When I understand my needs, I am able to articulate these to Neil and the people around me, like I mentioned earlier. I also know when these needs are not being met and what I can do to fix my unmet needs. So when I'm having that experience, like one of our girls has, she has these, this experience and she's not quite articulated it. When I know that some of my needs are not being met, I can look back and say, well, actually, I feel like that need for alone time isn't being met right now and it's causing me to feel X, Y, and Z. And I can go to Neil and say, hun, I feel like, I have a need right now to have some alone time. Can we try and facilitate that in our schedule this week? And he'll always say yes. I like to know the love languages of the people around me as well so that I can make sure that their needs are being met as well. I know Neil's love languages and the love languages of the girls. And while I don't always manage it, I do try to communicate to them in a manner which meets their, uh, speaks their language and meets their needs. So Ella right now is in primary two at school and she's learning all about her love bucket. And the teachers are talking to them about their love bucket buckets and it's trying to promote kindness and respect. And it's this idea that when people speak love to her or do kind things to her, it fills her bucket, it fills her love bucket. And people can also empty your bucket by doing things which are hurtful or unkind, etc. And the same principle applies here. When I'm speaking the love languages to the people that I love, in the language that they understand, their love language, their bucket, sorry, is being filled up. When no one is speaking your love language, it can empty your bucket. It can feel like an isolating, unloved and disconnected place to be. And that is what brings in some of these feelings that we described earlier and recognising that that is an unmet need can help us to communicate that to the people around us so that we have the opportunity to fill those needs. So let's go over the five love languages. And we're gonna do this quite briefly because we don't have all the time today to go through these deep uh, in depth, but I do recommend the book, Five Love Languages, if you are um, interested in knowing more about them. And these don't just apply to married couples, which uh, the book might suggest, but this is apl applicable to absolutely everybody in every relationship that you might have. We all have um, love languages and we all have needs. So the five love languages, words of affirmation, quality time, gifts, acts of service and physical touch. Now we tend to have one or two as our main languages, but we all speak all of them to a certain degree. So let's go through them briefly. Words of affirmation, this is a spoken form of love. There are multiple ways to give love to somebody who needs words of affirmation as their language. So you can give compliments, words of kindness, encouragement, praise. When you speak words of affirmation to a words of affirmation person, you are telling them that you see them, that you value them and that you value what they do. Now it can be as simple as saying, Hun, thank you for taking the bin out tonight. I saw that you did that and I really appreciate that you did that. But it can also be about who they are. So it might say, do you know, I want you to know that I think that you are a very kind and thoughtful person. You're always going out of your way to look out for people. It's a very encouraging thing to say. Now the word encourage means to give courage. For a word of affirmation person, this is done through belief being spoken to them through words. All right, quality time. This is time spent together. This is not sitting together watching TV. This is undivided attention. This is not date night over the TV or having a deep and meaningful chat when the kids are running around and shouting their needs over the top of you. This is dedicated time, being intentional together. Quality time is about togetherness, not proximity, 
but undivided attention. It is saying, you have my full attention. I have put all the other distractions aside. I may have scheduled it even into my calendar to make sure that I have no other distractions. My phone is away, the laptop is away, the TV is off, the kids are in bed or wherever, and I now am giving you my undivided attention. And you can do things together to create space for this, going for a meal, going for a walk, going on holiday without the phone and iPad and laptops, going out for coffee. So there's a lot of things that you can do for a quality time person. I had a friend who is a quality time person and she wants to know that when you are with her, you're not gonna be paying attention to your phone, but actually that you are being very intentional with time with her. And that is how her love bucket was filled up. Gifts. Gifts to the gift, per gift person are not actually about the gift. It is about what the gift symbolizes. What a gift says to the gift person is you thought about me when you were not with me and you gave me something to show me that you were thinking about me. It's not that you just thought about me when you're out at the supermarket, but you thought enough about me to pick up my favorite chocolate bar and bring that home and say, I thought about you when you were away and I know you well enough to know that this is your favorite chocolate bar and I now want to give you this to show you that I was thinking about you and that I know you well. So it is not about the size of the gift, it is about the meaning behind the gift. And they do not have to be bought things, they can be made things. They are really just something that symbolizes, I thought of you and I know you well. The purpose of gifts is to give something to the person whose love languages is gifts to show them that you love them and that you are thinking of them. Now time can also be a gift in a very, very busy person. We can also be given the gift of time. So there's multiple ways to show that, but it's really saying that when I was not with you, I was thinking about you and I did something to, uh, to show you that I, that I love you and I'm giving you that thing. Acts of service. Doing things for somebody which you know they would want you to do, something that is important to them, something that is meaningful to them, a need that they have is an act of service. Serving somebody in a way which is meaningful to that person. Now, it's not always meaningful to me as the giver. It would be meaningful to the person who I am doing that for. So here's an example. I know somebody who was moving house and a team of people came to help, thinking that they were serving my friend they emptied all of the kitchen boxes into her new kitchen cupboards, only for my friend to be absolutely horrified by this. She had a very specific way that she wanted her kitchen to be, and this was certainly not it. Now, they thought that they were serving her because they thought that they would have wanted somebody to have done that for them. But for her, this was not an act of service, but instead, unfortunately, became a very stressful moment for my friend. This language has to be something which is doing things that the other person would want to be done. It is not important to them then they won't hear that language being spoken, even if the other person thinks that they are serving. So you might think that you're speaking in the language of acts of service, but if you are not speaking in their dialect, it will not be picked up. So for an example, if Neil was to wash the cars and cut the grass, he might think that he is doing act of service for me. But if that is not important to me, then I will not see that. If instead, what I feel like I need done is the dishwasher to be unstacked and dinner to be made. So it is, has to be the way in which it meets the other person's need, not in what you think it needs to be done. Okay, physical touch. We all need physical touch to some degree. Babies and children need to be touched and cuddled as a way of showing love, affirmation and safety. And there is a component to this in which physical touch is everybody's need. But for some, physical touch is a really strong way of communicating love. Now, whether that is a hug, hand holding, a hand on your arm to say that you're with them, or just a big tickle session with the kids, there are lots of forms through which you can communicate touch. And for some people, touch is a way in which they feel um, that love has been communicated to them. So knowing our languages and the languages of the people around us that we love makes a big difference in helping our connections to remain strong. As well as knowing what your own needs are so you can communicate to those around you, it's really important to know what other people's love languages are. 
Now, I spend a lot of time looking at our girls, trying to understand their love languages as they grow and as they change, so that we can be filling their buckets to help them grow up, knowing them knowing that they are fully loved in a way in which they understand. Now, ultimately, I love my girls to the moon and back, but if I don't communicate that in a manner in which they understand, it can get a little bit lost in translation. So both our girls, one of their primary love languages is quality time. The more one-on-one -on -one time that they can have with us, the happier they are. It is a, a, an endless, a bottomless pit of a bucket, this quality time bucket for our girls. But one of our girls in particular is an absolute cuddle munchkin. Her favourite word is cuddle. She will come up to you in the middle of dinner, in the middle of a meeting and wherever, whatever you're doing and she'll just say cuddle and she just wants to be cuddled. And then when she's in that cuddle, she says, mummy, I could just live in a cuddle forever. It's just the cutest thing. But she feels most loved when she is deep inside of a cuddle or when she's at the mercy of the tickle monster being touched and cuddled and roughing around together. It's her absolute favourite place to be, is just deep inside of physical touch. Our other girl absolutely loves to serve. She is our little helper. She feels loved by being involved with what is going on and what is happening in the house, whether that is making a cake or making dinner or helping me in the garden. She just wants to be involved in what is going. She wants to help out. She wants to serve. That's what she wants to do. So she feels most loved when I can give her something to do, usually with me, which makes the quality time thing as well. But she loves to do that. Now, when I sat down with the girls and I asked them, out of the five of these they would prefer most, I went to the list of what all five of them were in a way that they could understand it. And I said, if you could pick one of these girls, what would you say? And they both yelled in unison, presents! <laughs> and Neil and I laughed because we know actually that if I was to give them presents, they would like that. But one of them would want to sit on my knee while I played with the present with them and the other one would want to do it with me while giving her something to do with the present as well. So I do know that every child loves to have presents but ultimately that isn't actually their main love language's love language because every child loves presents. So they haven't quite learned what their actual needs are but we all have the responsibility to know ourselves, to know our needs, to know our languages and communicate those needs to people around us. We cannot expect the people around us um, to, we cannot expect people around us who we are needing to fill our buckets to know our needs if we're not communicating them. And once they have communicated, they have the opportunity to meet those needs and to us to meet the needs of them. And what we do in that moment is that we grow connection, we grow, grow trust, we, we, we meet together in vulnerability, meeting one another's needs, knowing that I matter and you matter as powerful people. We all matter. I, as a powerful person, I understand what my needs are and I'm able to communicate those clearly, knowing that I matter. But I also know that you matter and I know what your needs are. And so I hear those needs and I create time and space and opportunity to show you what those needs are because we both matter and we are both equal in this and we have taken time to understand that and to connect together. Communication is about understanding, understanding ourselves and understanding the people around us. And once we understand them, then we can communicate in a way which shows love. Love your neighbour as yourself. As a church family, relationships and communication are core to who we are with God and with one another. I'm really looking forward to exploring this more this week in our small groups as we learn what it is to know ourselves so that we can love people around us and be loved by them, strengthening our relationships. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the gift of relationship, for the ability to connect and to love one another with purpose and with strength, with mutual respect. God, I pray for us that we would um, know our needs, that you would help us to understand our needs and to communicate them clearly around us. God, I pray that you would strengthen our connections as a church as we show love and value to one another. I pray that you'd bless our relationships. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Joe, so much for that, for taking us on into uh, our Family Foundation series. Uh, I'm really enjoying just the, the practical nature of this series, that we can learn to do our relationships really well. So thanks for that, Joe. And thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you with us, as always. Uh, we wish we were in the room with you, but this is, uh, this is also good. Uh, and if you want to connect with us for next week, we'll be back again at the same time next week on YouTube. There'll be no Zoom call next week, but we'll be meeting in person at 1.30 St Andrew Blackadder Church. You can find out more on our website. If you want to uh, subscribe on YouTube, then that would be great because that helps you keep up to date with all of our upcoming content. So please have an amazing week. We're praying for you. We are praying that you know God's peace with you this week in your relationships, that you would know his love and his wisdom as you, as you engage with relationships in a new way this week. We bless you and we'll see you soon.